Howdy Connection Group Leaders, happy Thursday. I hope you're doing well. I am outside sitting on a rock because we're gonna talk about water coming out of a rock. I thought I'd be cute. We actually do have water that sort of comes out of rocks and it's one of those deals right there. So, haha, <laughs> and I cute. And actually the other fun thing is everybody's favorite rock salesman lives, well, he doesn't live, he works right there. I don't know if you know if Melvin if you knew that or not, Melvin works across the street. He calls it Tater Hill. Actually, that was the official name in the neighborhood at the time. Uh, but anyway, Smith Custom Masonry over there. If you want to talk about rocks with somebody or how to play with rocks, Melvin's your guy. Great, great dude. Um, let me make a suggestion. So this week's lesson covers, gosh, a ton of ground because it's the high point of Moses' life, right? And the idea is we're just seeing some of the lessons that Moses learned, and, and it is, it's good stuff. There's nothing wrong with it. And if you wanna to try to tackle that as a class, by all means, go and do that. But I think there's some value in taking one of those sections, and I'm gonna give you my suggested section. You could do it with any of them. Taking one of those suggestions and actually breaking it down, certainly with, with our teenagers. And my reasoning really is kind of double-folded. We just talked about most Moses with the teenagers just back in the fall, and we covered um, the Exodus portion pretty well. And I know we're going to talk about that more coming up, but even still, we, we really looked at the character of Moses, but I didn't talk about the Numbers 20 passage. And the more I thought about it, that's really a passage that we don't talk a lot about any. I can't say any. We don't talk about a lot. Uh, so if you ask a lot of people, hey, how come Moses didn't get to go in the promised land? They'll tell you, oh, it's because he threw the, the tablets down and broke them. It's a pretty common, common thought. We know that's not true, though. It's actually this story here in Numbers 20. And there's a lot of value in it. So here's, let me give you a couple of high points that I think is worth, again, certainly our teenagers hearing, but really our adults too. And, and, and the first one is this. We see the children of Israel. They don't have any water. Actually, first we see Miriam die. That, that is somewhat of an important point. We're nearing the end of the Exodus time. They've been roaming in the desert for approximately 37 years at this point. And the time's coming to a close. Remember, it's about 40 years when, when that's over and Moses finally dies and they go into the promised land. Miriam dies three years beforehand, so it's about 37 years. Anyway, Miriam dies, and suddenly they're without water again. This isn't the first time this has happened. They've seen God answer this problem, but nonetheless, when they run out of water, they begin to complain. Now, complaining because you're thirsty is not entirely unreasonable. It's not, it's not unreasonable to say, hey, I need a drink. All of you who are parents and all of you who used to be kids, we, we've all made this request of our parents. We might have even gotten a little bit... Uh, dramatic about, oh, I'm going to die. I'm so thirsty. Oh my goodness, right? So they come to Moses and they grumble and they rumble and they talk about, oh, this is so awful. Why did you do this to us? Here's what you need to catch though. And this is the important part of the process. These are all people who were born, not all of them, but most of them were people who were born in the wilderness. When they make statements like, man, why'd you even bring us out here? Moses didn't bring them out here. They've been born in the wilderness. This is the only life they know. They've known God's provision their entire lives. And yet they're still rumbling and they're grumbling and they're making statements like, why did you even bring me out of here? Who did they learn that from? From their parents, many of whom have already paid the penalty for complaining and paid the penalty for not trusting God in the first place. Nonetheless, they learn that action from their parents. Man, there's a lot that we can learn from that. You know, why are we telling the students uh, you know, what they can learn from their parents? Not Parents need to know, hey, your kids are picking up on, on your, um, if you wanna say small sinful preferences or small sinful practices, right? And, and particularly our attitudes, you know that, they pick up on that. Now, several of you are gonna go, man, I have a great attitude, my kid's attitude stinks. Yes, they do, because they're human. One of the things that I talk to the teenagers about, particularly of my older kids, uh, when we go on trips is, hey guys, I want you to set the, the standard on what a proper attitude is gonna be. So for instance, this mission trip that we just took a few weeks ago, I told my three oldest students, man, I really need y'all to have a great attitude because as we start to work and we get into a couple of gross things, it's gonna be really easy for the younger ones. Most of our trip was junior high students. It'll be really easy for them to just grumble and be upset, but if y'all will maintain a great attitude, they'll follow suit too. The children of Israel has learned this action from their parents, and so they're now they're following suit and committing the same sins. But I love, love, love that we see God's grace in this, truly. He could have said, fine, man, y'all go thirsty, <laughs> and he didn't. 
He calls in Moses and Aaron, says, boys, we're, we're gonna give them some water, but this time I truly want these guys who didn't see it the first time, gotta catch that too. Again, most of these guys weren't around in Exodus chapter 17 when God had Moses strike the rock the first time to give water from a rock. They didn't see this. So he's saying, I want my children to see my glory firsthand. And so walk up to the rock and speak to it and it's gonna give you water. Notice Moses, who's angry, speaks to them out of anger. And that's when he strikes the rock. And you almost get the impression he hits the rock the first time and nothing happens. And so he gets even more angry and hits it again. And that's when the water pops out. And again, there's grace there, right? God, God could have said, no, I told you to speak to it, but you got to whack it. God in his grace gave the people who were thirsty what they needed. And of course, Moses has got to pay the consequences for his sins. We all need to remember that even though God is incredibly gracious, sin always has consequences. And sometimes it's long-term consequences. Doesn't mean that God doesn't love us. Doesn't mean that we're not saved anymore. Doesn't mean we don't get to go to heaven, but it does mean that we're gonna suffer some consequences here. So there's a lot of good stuff in this particular chapter. So it, again, if it were me, I would focus on that particular section with your students this week. None the, whoever it is that you teach though, whatever it is that you, you tackle though, I mean, emphasize God's grace, emphasize that sin does have consequences, just natural, normal human consequences. And then emphasize again, um, the stuff that you learn as a child carries over to adulthood and it affects the way you raise your kids and then your kids follow suit in the stuff that you are teaching them also. So let's all be mindful of that as we're raising all these little goobers around us. And we're all committed, this is hill number, hill number two, we're all committed to the discipleship of all these kids running in our building. So let's collectively do that well. Love you guys. We'll talk to you later. Everybody go get a drink. See ya.